continued worship at Good Shepherd Anglican Church on Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta on this Good Friday in the year of our Lord 2022. Whether you are joining us from home, you're here in person or watching the recording of this service later, we are happy to observe these three sacred days, the Tridrium Sacrum with you. If you are at home, Reverend Tom will be your guide through this service. If you have any questions or technical difficulties, please do type into the chat so he can assist you. Our service will begin momentarily in silence as we continue our worship from the previous night. The ministers will enter and prostrate ourselves. We invite you to rise when we rise. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death. Even death on a cross. Almighty God. Have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for readings from God's holy word. A reading from Isaiah 52, verse 13 to chapter 53. Verse 12, see my servants shall propose. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high, just as there were many who were astonished at him. So marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told them they shall see, and that which they have not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a roof out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one who, from whom others hide their face, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. 
yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded by our transgressions, crushed by our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silence. So he did not open his mouth, but a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for transgressions in, of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he did not, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteousness of my servant shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion for the great, with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong. Because he pours out himself to death and has numbered with transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many and made intercessions for the transgression, transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Please join in praying Psalm 22 using the emergent Psalter. Please listen to the music team to catch the song Antiphon.
Sorry, we're working on the sound problem now. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword. I will the dead. Save me from the sword. My reckless God is of my soul. I will declare your name in my righteousness. In the congregation, I will praise you. We're still working on the sound issues. Not sure what happened. We'll keep trying. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore 
or approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace in help in time, to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience to what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing with heart or in voice the hymn which announces the gospel, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Passion Gospel according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to the place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, 
who betrayed him was standing with them when Jesus said to them, I am he. They stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the words that had been spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Judean guards arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Judean leaders that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside of the gate. So the other disciples, the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slave and the guards had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Judeans come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the guards standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, Are you not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. They then took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, Are you the king of the Judeans? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have him handed over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Judean leaders replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus has said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Judeans? Jesus answered, Do you ask us on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Judean, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Judeans. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? 
After he had said this, he went out to the Judean leaders and again told them, I find no case against this against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to read? Do you want me to release for you the king of the Judeans? They shouted in reply. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wore, wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Judeans. And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Judean leaders answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid than ever. He entered the headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Judean leaders cried out. If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stone, the stone pavement or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover and it was about noon. And he said to the Judean leaders, Here is your king. They cried out, Pilate asked them, Should I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate had had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Judeans. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Judeans said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Judeans, but this man said, I am king of the Judeans. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and they divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes amongst them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. 
a jar full of sour wine was standing there. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Judean leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was the day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. When the soldiers came down and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look at the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear for the Judean leaders, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spice in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in that place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was a Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they lead Jesus there. Please be seated. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus felt forsaken on the cross. In his last moments, with his final breath, Jesus cries out words he has prayed so often, psalms he knows so deeply, Words so imprinted on his heart that they have become the only response he has for the pain and violence he is experiencing. But Jesus is not the only one who feels forsaken by God. David did when he wrote these words generations before his Lord would die for his sake. He cried out his despair at God's lack of answer. He poured out to God the depth of his humiliation. He reminded God of the covenant they had made on his mother's breast. These words have been prayed over and over again throughout human history by Hamlet for one thing and by people like us. People who have been so despised by others, they feel like a worm and no man, people whose bones are out of joint, people who are stared and gloated over while their enemies take what belongs to them, people who have been laughed at for trusting in God when times are hard. Times are always hard, but for many of us, they feel particularly hard right now. And so we join with David and Jesus and we pray, be not far from me, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. 
Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. We beg God to help us, to save us, for we have no other helper. Who will stand with the weak and the vulnerable in this world that prizes strength and invulnerability? Who will take care of the poor and those in need when there is profit to be made? And even the church, Christ's body on earth, Christ who has no hands but ours, Christ who commanded us to love one another as he has loved us all too often, fails to show that love to anybody other than those whose power and wealth we seek to woo. Jesus was forsaken on that cross all right, but not by God. Jesus was God. God was present with him. God was in his very cells, the very muscles and tendons being ripped apart on that cross were God's. God did not forsake Jesus. We did. We do. As the hymn we are about to sing says, who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason. Jesus hath undone thee. Twas I, Lord Jesus. I, it was, denied thee. I crucified thee. These words are true, and it is good to take them to heart. But I also call you to be of good courage. For the Jesus who knew this psalm so well, that it formed his almost final words on this earth, also knew how it ends. It ends not with lament, but with praise for the Lord who does save, the Lord who is our helper. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them, but when they cry to him, he hears them. God is faithful unto death, even death on a cross. When we forsake him, he does not forsake us. Even from the cross, he cared for his mother. He cared for his friend. He cared for us, whom he knew already, with whom he had made a covenant millennia before we were born. Before the foundation of the world, he prepared to do this. To hold fast when we broke faith. To love us to the end. From childhood, Joseph, his father, prepared him. The poet writes, he knew his son would outshine him from the beginning. So taught this child the only thing he could, the skill of taking blades and wood and turning death into something else entirely. Death has been turned into something else entirely. That is what Jesus came to this earth to do. For our God has not and will not ever forsake us. Not now, not in the hardest of times, and not at the hour of our death. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that th the world through him might be saved to all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Let us pray for the one holy Catholic Church. Let us pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Stephen, our bishop, and all the people of the diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those who are about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Elizabeth, our queen, and all the royal family, for Justin, the prime minister, and for the government of this country, for Jason, the premier of this province, and the members of the legislature, for Amarjeet, the major, mayor of this municipality, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help, they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, Kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people who possess an eternal covenant with the Lord who delivered them from bondage to freedom, for continued faithfulness to God's covenant with them, for their flourishing in peace as witnesses to God's sustaining love, for safety from all malice and harm, for the fullness of redemption for the sake of God's name, that unity and concord may exist between Jews and Christians in obedience to God's will. God of Abraham, you planted your people Israel as the root and grafted Gentiles as wild branches into a single olive tree of praise to you. As we come near to the cross, we lament Christian acts of prejudice and violence against your faithful people of whom Jesus Christ was born. So bless the children of your covenant that we together may attain the fullness of your blessing for the world. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or mind, for those who are hungry and homeless, destitute and oppressed, for those who are ill or disabled in body, mind, or spirit, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, 
for those who are sorrowful and bereaved, for those who are persecuted for the sake of Christ, for prisoners, refugees, and captives, for victims of war, genocide, and trafficking, and all those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for those who have not embraced God's redeeming love, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin and indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are persecutors of his disciples, for those in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, the source of life and fountain of mercy, let the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, be preached with grace and love. Turn the hearts of the followers of Jesus who have harmed others in his name. Lead all to repentance and amendment of life and sustain by your loving grace all who lift their eyes to you. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him, through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the savior of the world. Come, let us worship. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the savior of the world. Come, let us worship. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the savior of the world. Come, let 
Let's worship. You're invited, if you would like to, to come forward. You can kneel or stand before the cross, touch it, or press your forehead to it in silent prayer as we sing.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon. Bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen.
That concludes our service for this morning or this afternoon. Take care, everyone.